Welcome to another session of IntelliQuest's The World's 100 Greatest Books. This session is unique for many reasons. First of all, we'll be exploring one of the oldest known examples of English literature and the only work in our series with an unknown author. Secondly, this work is far more than an example of ancient literature. It is also a piece of history, valued as much by linguists and history scholars as it is by poets, writers, and critics. For many years after its discovery, it wasn't even read by the general public, but only by specialists in various fields of study. It supplied new information about a bygone age that is hidden in mystery, and it offered a glimpse into the customs, events, and beliefs of a civilization about which there are few written records. Its significance in literature is therefore quite different from most of the other works in this series. The work we are talking about is Beowulf an heroic epic poem written somewhere between 650 and 750 A.D. by an anonymous poet, and the most famous specimen of Old English literature. It can be referred to either as Old English or Anglo-Saxon. Both are correct, since Old English refers to the language of both the Angles and the Saxons. There is only one solitary text of Beowulf, now in the cotton collection of the British Museum. The story is set in a time about a hundred or two hundred years before it was written, the time of the sixth century. It is set in what is called the Land of the Geat, which we know to be southern Sweden and Denmark. The poem is derived from both historical events and from Norse folklore. It is known for its combination of Christian ideas and themes and pagan ideas and themes. In this mixture of beliefs, it reflects the complexity of Anglo-Saxon culture after the coming of Christianity, which occurred around 597 A.D. Therefore, the conversion to Christianity happened only a century before the poem was written, and Germanic traditions had not yet been completely stamped out. So the poem sometimes seems to blend Christian theology and pagan mythology, and at other times the two seem to conflict. This mingling of two philosophies testifies to the great upheavals that occurred in northern civilizations as the poem was taking form during the early Middle Ages. Although we know nothing about the poet who penned Beowulf, we can make some conclusions about the origin of the poem from historical information we do have. We know that when our Teutonic ancestors migrated to Britain from Europe, they brought with them the heroic songs in which they celebrated the deeds of their kings and warriors. The poets who sang these songs were called scops, which means literally shapers. A scop was a wandering person, like a troubadour or minstrel, and his role was to entertain during celebrations and feasts. He entertained by singing heroic tales about heroes who were both real and legendary. If a man's name lived on in those times, it was largely due to the work of the scop, or poet. The poets combined myth with truth, because myth lasts far longer than historical fact, and during these times, a people could forget their entire history within only a century and a half. The songs of the poets glorified history, partly so history would be remembered. Sometime after the introduction of Christianity, perhaps in the 7th century, a poet in England gathered material from these songs and composed the epic Beowulf. He took his stories from the songs, but he also took his style and metrical beat from the songs. To what extent he used their original language, we have no way of knowing. Undoubtedly, he added his own comments and reflections, and the structure of the epic is certainly his. Beowulf was orally passed down from generation to generation by the North European peoples. Although the people before him sang these songs or chanted them, often accompanied by a harp, the poet of this work wrote a book to be read. Therefore, Beowulf became not just a ballad or folk song, but a much more highly developed form of art. One of the styles the poet took from the songs on which the epic is based is a kind of figurative language called the kenning. The kenning is a metaphorical compound in which two words are combined to replace another common word. For example, the sun is called the world candle or the ocean is called a whale road, or a sword is called a battle flasher. Some of these kennings became clichés, such as the popular use of ring giver for a prince. But when used creatively, the kenning served the same use as the metaphor. It was colorful and poetic, and it helped the poet meet the metric needs of the poem. It was the Scops tradition, carried on in Beowulf, 
to write in the four-beat alliterative line. The two-beat kenning was substituted for words that wouldn't fit in these lines. The kenning is one example of the unique style of these oral ballads that the poet of Beowulf integrated into his written work. The exploits and events of the poem were those of the Germanic peoples before they crossed the North Sea. At least one of the characters can be identified as a real historic personage, and that is Hegelach, a Danish king who died around 520 A.D., and who in the poem was the uncle of the hero of the epic, Beowulf. That enables us to date Beowulf's escapades in the poem as sometime around the 6th century. But in spite of this and perhaps other historic personalities, the events of the poem are legendary, not historic. There are fights with monsters and dragons and superhuman exploits that indicate legend had attached itself to these historic characters, whose lives had already become vague and shadowy. In much the same way Americans have built incredible legends around Davy Crockett, Paul Bunyan, Johnny Appleseed, and other heroes of our past, this epic poem has made superheroes out of real men and fantastical exploits out of normal deeds of bravery and triumph. Some people believe Beowulf is pure mythology, but although it contains mythical elements, the poet believed his hero to be thoroughly human, and the interpretation of his enemies as ghosts and monsters is the kind of superstition that existed among the peasantry for hundreds of years, and still exists in certain areas of Europe. Beowulf is a confusing mixture in many ways. We've already mentioned the mixture of Christian and pagan thought, but the perspective in the poem also belongs to different eras. It is a story about events that happened on the continent, but it was written by a poet who lived a century or two later in England. Therefore, some of his images were probably drawn from his own times. This may be confusing, but it also makes Beowulf doubly valuable. It's the only example of the imaginative work of the Teutonic peoples, but it also throws light on the culture and ideals of the poet's time, the first centuries of the English occupation of Britain. We know a little about the times in which this poet lived, from archaeological discoveries and scattered writings. The Anglo-Saxons, like their Germanic ancestors, probably lived in a tribal state for some time after they arrived in Britain. The tribes had only two classes, the aristocracy, or earls, and the plebeians, or churls, which included bondsmen and captives. In addition, there were freemen, who were apparently granted this separate status as a reward for good deeds. The head of the tribe was the king, whose heredity could be traced to Woden, king of the gods. To advise the king, there was a council of elders called the Witten. Interestingly enough, some historians have traced the British Parliament back to the Witten. The importance of the individual in Anglo-Saxon society depended on his social class. Women were perhaps least valued of all. They were expected to be domestic and moral, although, as scholars learned in reading Beowulf, aristocratic women sometimes served as peacemakers or arbiters. Literature of the period, including Beowulf, gives us few glimpses into the daily life of the average person. Old English literature focused instead on battles, struggles, and the deeds of the famous. Beowulf was meant to appeal to the educated class of Anglo-Saxon society. But this society was new and hadn't yet let go of its traditions, which included a warlike spirit, aggressiveness, and the glories of battle. Therefore, the characters in the poem are chiefly warriors and their enemies, giving us only a partial picture of civilization at the time. But it does give us a picture of feudalism, with its clear divisions of class and highly defined social roles and relationships and it gives us descriptions of many of the customs of the time. Archaeological discoveries indicate that the Anglo-Saxons had developed a sophisticated culture. Exquisitely worked gold objects have been found from the era, and royal burial sites indicate that music and poetry played an important role in court. The presence of Christian objects at such sites also implies that, as we've said, pagan customs were beginning to give way to Christian beliefs. In Beowulf, there are contradictory references to God, to fate, to stories of the Bible, and to Norse mythology. The Germanic idea of destiny, or weird as it's called, becomes confused with the Christian almighty God. Beowulf also seems confusing and disjointed to some readers because the action-packed narrative is frequently interrupted. The poet digresses into speeches, pronouncements, genealogy, 
songs, chants, and remembrances of past battles and heroes, and obscure historical references. This has caused some critics to say the work lacks unity. For many readers, these digressions seem repetitious or irrelevant to the story. But these interruptions and digressions played an important role in the days when Beowulf was presented orally. They served as excellent mnemonics or memory joggers that helped the storyteller remember the narrative. The repetition also helped the audience. It helped them remember the story, which is lengthy and difficult to absorb on a first hearing. In addition, these historical sidebars meant more to the audience of the time than they do to us. They enabled listeners to connect the main story with known facts and events, of which we have little or no knowledge. Beowulf is an epic, a word that comes from the Greek meaning tale. An epic is a long narrative poem with themes and characters of heroic proportions. Epics are often divided into two types, primary and secondary epics. Primary epics are the earliest written versions of poems which come out of an oral tradition. These poems were sung by generations of poets and finally written down by a literate poet or scribe. The greatest primary epics known to us are Beowulf, the Iliad, and the Odyssey. Secondary epics are later works that are based on earlier or primary epics and which borrow some of the style and subject matter of the original. An example of this kind of epic is Virgil's Aeneid. Both forms of epics are known for their exalted style, a complex theme which captures important events of the epic, and a hero who represents the culture of the times. Epics also begin in the middle of a story, or in the language of literature, in medias res. Beowulf fulfills all these requirements. The poet concentrates on the exploits of a hero during a section of his life. The hero embodies the ideals of his people and the time in history. The story tells of heroic struggles in a style that is elaborate and captures the spirit of its heroic subject. It's a patriotic epic designed to exalt the virtues and achievements of its people. There were probably epics before Beowulf, it's a relatively late product of Anglo-Saxon civilization. But any fully developed epics before it were either never recorded or have been lost. Beowulf remains our only native epic. For this reason alone, Beowulf is worth reading, but there are other reasons. As an epic must, Beowulf gives us a good idea of the view of life that humankind had at the time of its writing. The poem reveals to us that the Anglo-Saxons regarded life as a struggle by man against the limitations of time, against great forces of destruction, and against the passing glories of this earth. For this insight alone, it is valuable reading. Yet for many years after its discovery, it was read by very few people. For centuries it was forgotten, and even when it was published and studied in the 19th century, it was considered only a product of an insignificant and barbarous age. Now we know that age was not barbarous, but in many ways sophisticated, and that the thoughts, aspirations, and ideals of its people are as worthy as those of any age. Those thoughts and ideals come vividly to life in Beowulf, as you'll soon see. But before we begin the story, you'll need to meet the major characters, most important of whom is, of course, the hero, Beowulf himself. Beowulf is not an Anglo-Saxon. He's a member of the Gaeth a Scandinavian people related to Anglo-Saxons. Beowulf's life is almost divided in two parts in the poem, and so in a sense he is two characters, the younger Beowulf and the older. The youthful Beowulf is a hero who hasn't established a reputation for himself yet. He's very anxious to accomplish good and great deeds and to behave according to his sense of form or the ideal standards of a true noble. He's ambitious and glory-seeking, but he's also generous and kind, and never mistreats the weak. The older Beowulf is a man who's become a little weary of the struggles he's outlived. He's more contemplative and subject to melancholy, but still capable of rising to a heroic challenge. He's a good king to his people and an admirable leader who instills confidence and loyalty. Other key characters include Rothgar, king of the Danes, Beowulf journeys to Rothgar's court at the beginning of the poem to rescue his people from a horrible man-eating monster. Unferth, a Danish warrior. Unferth is a member of Rothgar's court and one of the more complex characters in the story. He taunts and incites Beowulf and originally takes on an adversarial role to the hero. 
but later he supports Beowulf and even offers his own precious sword for Beowulf's use in slaying the mother of the monster. And finally there is Wiglaf, Beowulf's nephew and loyal court noble. Wiglaf plays a key role towards the end of the story, when Beowulf fights his last battle, this time against a dragon. In some ways he reminds the reader of the younger Beowulf, anxious for adventure and glory, and even a little reckless. But he's brave and stands by Beowulf when all others desert him. As the story begins, it is long ago in the Danish kingdom of Hrothgar, and a gruesome giant monster named Grendel is roaming the countryside at night. Grendel is descended from the first murderer, Cain, and has been angered by the singing of the bards. He rises from his home deep in the marsh, stalks to the king's high hall, and there devours fifteen of the king's warriors at a time. Then, before departing, the monster would seize fifteen more men with his huge arms and carry them back to his watery den. For twelve years this slaughter continued. The king had lost all his best men, and the strength of the kingdom was gone. The Danes evoked their ancient gods to no avail. The poet tells us they were unaware of the Christian god. They did not know the Creator, the judge of actions. They did not know the Lord God. Then word of the terror spread across the sea to the land of the Geats, ruled by Higelach. Higelach had a warrior who was his principal advisor, a man of great strength and courage who was named Beowulf. When Beowulf heard the tales of Grendel's murderous attacks, he set sail at once to free the Danes from this horrible demon. His journey is described this way. Impelled over the waves by wind, the foamy prow like a bird sped onward, till the next day's hour showed ocean shores shining, lofty hills, expansive shorelands. When Beowulf and his men arrived in Denmark, they were met by a coast watcher who kept a lookout for unwelcome invaders. When he saw the weary company of fifteen seafarers approaching, he was suspicious. But he could tell by their clothes and bearing that they were noble men, and he thought of Beowulf that he'd never seen a greater earl on earth. When Beowulf told him of his intended mission, the coast watcher permitted the company to pass. The poem continues. They started out then. The spacious ship remained behind, riding on its rope. Figures of boars, bright and fire-hardened, gleamed gold-adorned above the cheek guards. In war, the boar helped guard those fierce men's lives. The men marched to King Rothgar's high hall. There the king held a banquet feast in Beowulf's honor. The mead cup was passed around and the boasting began. The Danish warrior Unferth, drunken with wine and jealous of Beowulf's glory, began to taunt and challenge Beowulf. He told the story of a five-day swimming contest in which Beowulf, the Geat, was said to have been bested and lost. Beowulf denied the truth of this. He said instead that he had not only emerged victorious in the race, but had been forced to kill nine deadly sea monsters in the course of it. One monster had carried him all the way to the bottom of the sea. Beowulf had swum for five days and nights in the icy water before reaching the shore. When all the boasting was done, Beowulf asked Hrothgar for the right of slaying the monster, and Hrothgar granted him that right, promising him many riches and rewards should he succeed. Beowulf said he would not use weapons against the monster, but would battle him with only his own physical prowess. When the feast was over, Rothgar and his warriors went to bed, leaving Beowulf and his men alone in the hall. The men were fearful and had trouble sleeping, suspecting this was their last night on earth. But Beowulf slept soundly. Then, says the poem, from afar in the murky night, the shadow walker approached. Grendel crashed into the room with an unlovely light like a hellish flame in his eyes. The heavy iron door burst open at just a touch of his fingers, and he rejoiced when he saw the rich feast of human flesh that waited there before him. He grabbed one sleeping warrior, tore him up furiously, bit through his muscles and sinews, and then drank the blood in streams. Then he quickly swallowed the whole corpse, as a wolf might eat a rabbit. Then Grendel moved towards his next victim, Beowulf, but he was destined for no more victims that night. Beowulf took hold of the beast with his bare, powerful hands, and fearful, the beast struggled to free itself. That struggle shook the entire hall, and the wails of the creature terrified the Danes who waited outside. Beowulf's companions were powerless to help him, because the monster had put a spell on them. 
Finally, Beowulf wrenched off Grendel's right arm, and the maimed beast fled back to its home. Beowulf had vanquished the fiend without even shield or spear. The poet proclaims, The wise and brave warrior from afar had cleansed Hrothgar's hall, reclaiming it from woe. As a sign of victory, Beowulf hung the monster's bloody arm on the wall as a trophy. The hall was then cleansed, repaired, and decorated for the celebration that would follow. Hrothgar and his men honored Beowulf with another feast and with magnificent priceless gifts. The poet says, The men drank wine, ignorant of fate or how grim calamity had befallen many men. Hrothgar departed for his court, and the warriors slept in the hall as they did before. Grendel's mother appeared that night. Brooding and miserable, she made a sorry journey to avenge her son. She rushed into the great hall and seized Eshera, a famed and heroic warrior who was the king's dearest counselor and friend. Grendel's mother then tore her son's severed arm from the wall and fled into the darkness with the arm and Eshera. Through all this, Beowulf had been asleep in a house some distance from the hall. He did not learn of the she-monster's visit until the next morning, when he innocently asked Hrothgar if he'd had an easy night. When he heard what had transpired the night before, he vowed to free the people of this second, even more wretched demon. Beowulf turned to comfort the king, who grieved over the loss of his dear friend Eshera, with these words. Grieve not, wise warrior. It is better to avenge one's friend than mourn too much. Each of us must one day reach the end of worldly life. Let him who can live in glory before he dies, that lives on after him when he lifeless lies. With King Rothgar leading the way, the Danes and Beowulf cautiously approached the marsh lair where Grendel and his mother lived. When they arrived at the edge of the moor, the soldiers came upon the head of the ill-fated Eshera and saw stains of blood in the water. Swimming in that water were fire drakes and sea dragons. Beowulf readied himself to descend into the water, down to the home of the foe. Unfair, who had previously mocked Beowulf about his performance in the swimming contest, now offered him his own blood-hardened sword, the finest in the kingdom, which he said, never in battle was untrue to any man. In doing so, he forfeited a chance to win for himself immortal fame and glory, for he would not enter the waters. Beowulf sank himself into the deep, murky waters and was at once surrounded by enormous and vicious creatures. After an immense struggle, he continued on, descending for nearly a day before he reached the bottom. He came to the cave of Grendel's mother and entered. The battle began. Beowulf at first tried to wound the monster with Unferth's sword, but for the first time this weapon failed. He turned instead to his mighty hand grip, said to be strong enough to match the strength of thirty men. He was able to grasp the monster by the shoulder, but she threw him to the ground and tried to stab him with her dagger. Beowulf was protected by his sturdy armor, without which he would have perished. In the hand-to-hand -hand combat that followed, he was almost overcome. Then fate intervened. On the floor of the monster's den, in the midst of other weapons pried from the hands of fallen warriors, Beowulf saw a legendary sword that had once belonged to a race of ancient giants. He stretched with all his might and managed to take hold of the invincible and strong-edged blade. He plunged it into the heart of Grendel's mother, who first rose and then fell in a heap of death. Beowulf then turned and saw Grendel himself, lying crippled on the ground nearby. Swiftly he swung the sword again and cut Grendel's loathsome head from his body. The warriors waiting above saw the water turn red and concluded Beowulf had died. The Danes returned sadly to the hall, but Beowulf's men remained, gazing sadly at the sight of their lord's death. Now Beowulf left the cave and began his swim towards the surface. But as he did, the wondrous sword melted, leaving only the head and hilt intact. When they saw Beowulf alive and once again undefeated, the men rejoiced and the Danes offered him yet another feast. Beowulf gave the sword hilt as a gift to Rothgar and laid the head of the monster at his feet. Then he returned Unferth's weapon to him without speaking of its uselessness. This, comments the poet, is the mark of a great and generous warrior. Now it was time for Beowulf to return to his homeland of the Geats. He took leave of the grateful King Hrothgar, who was grieved to see him go. The lines read, 
The man was so dear to him that he could not restrain the feeling in his breast. But in his heart, held in the bonds of thought, longing after the dear man flamed against blood. Beowulf left Denmark in great glory and was received in glory at home. When he returned to the court of Higelach, he was rewarded with riches and high position. He himself laid the treasure he received from the Danes at the feet of his king. And after several years, when Higelach and his successor had both been killed, Beowulf himself became king of the Geats. Beowulf reigned wisely and bravely for fifty years, and then one day a runaway serf, suffering from the displeasure of his master, stumbled across an ancient treasure and stole away with a golden goblet. He presented it to his master in hopes of winning greater favor, but the treasure from which he'd taken the goblet had been in the guardianship of a mighty dragon. For three centuries it had remained intact, and when the dragon found it missing, it rose in fury and began to ravage the villages of Geat with fire. Beowulf was now an old man, and he knew he was tired and had lost some of his strength. He was somewhat melancholy, but when the dragon destroyed his own home, he was roused to action. He became determined to rid his kingdom of this scourge and to win the rest of the dragon's treasure for his people. He ordered that an iron shield be made instead of the customary wooden ones. He sensed this might be his final battle, so he paused to gather strength, to bid farewell to his faithful subjects, and to reflect on his long life of valiant deeds. Then he advanced towards the dragon's cave, guided by the servant who stole the cup and accompanied by twelve companions. He stopped outside the cave, momentarily saddened because he knew his end was near. The poem says, His mind was sad, wandering and death-dwelling, his doom near at hand, which the old man must salute and seek his soul reward, parting asunder life from body. Then, ready for battle, Beowulf said, I have undertaken many battles in my youth. I will seek again conflict as a sagacious guardian of my people, and gloriously defeat the atrocious spoiler if he will seek me out from his earth hall. He ordered his warriors to withdraw so that he alone might battle the horrible beast. It is not your venture to match your might with the fearful foes, to do this heroic deed. By daring shall I gain the gold, or dire battle ending life will take your lord away. Then he advanced to meet the dragon. Inside the cave, Beowulf found that his shield was little protection against the dragon's fiery breath. But still he plunged on through the flames and struck the dragon's side with his famed and ancient sword. The sword had no effect against the dragon's tough hide. The foil shattered on the creature's bony plate, and the infuriated dragon only belched forth more intense fire. Once again, Beowulf was forced to resort to his strong grip. As the battle grew more savage, all the king's warriors fled into the woods, except one. Wiglaf, a young kinsman of Beowulf, stood by to defend his ruler. He rallied his lord's spirits by saying, Dear Beowulf, perform as well as you said in your youth that you would, that you would not let your greatness sink while you were alive. Then, unable to restrain himself any longer, Wiglaf hurled himself into the flames, waving his own sword. The dragon, full of wrath, fell upon both warriors and covered them in flames. The flames consumed Wiglaf's wooden shield, and he sought cover under the iron shield of Beowulf. Beowulf's sword finally failed him, snapping in half. Never in any of his battles had iron served him. The dragon rushed and sank its terrible fangs into Beowulf's neck, but Wiglaf, ignoring his hand which was scorched from the fire, bravely struck the beast on its underside with his sword and his war knife. Immediately the fire began to lessen. Beowulf, coming to his senses, then gave the dragon the final death blow, ripping its belly open with his dagger. Now, weak from loss of blood, the old hero sat down. He knew the effects of the venom from the dragon's fangs and awaited his death. He asked Wiglaf to show him the treasure hoard so he could die more peacefully. Wiglaf brought as much of the treasure as he could carry, and Beowulf thanked God that he'd been able to acquire so much wealth for his people. Then he gave Wiglaf instructions for his funeral pyre and made a gift of his ring, helmet, and armor to the young man, who was the last of his family line. His final words were, you are the last remnant of our race. Destiny has taken all my kinsmen to the godhead, earls in their valor. I shall follow them. 
Wiglaf mourned the passing of his hero and kinsman. The dragon lay nearby, lifeless but still bleeding. Legend says no hero, however courageous, had ever braved the fire of the dragon or touched its treasure hoard. The companions of Beowulf emerged from the woods where they had fled. Wiglaf denounced them as cowards who could have saved Beowulf's life. He said that death is better than the dishonor that will surely follow them. After learning of the events in the cave, the whole company came to see the body of the fallen warrior and the corpse of the slain dragon. No one dared touch the treasure, thinking only a man of God's choosing could do it. The princes who placed the treasure in the cave had pronounced a curse on it that should last until the last day of the world. Wiglaf gave the order to prepare Beowulf's funeral pyre. Next he summoned seven of the best men, and with them entered the cave of the dragon. They heaved the body of the dragon over a cliff and loaded the treasure onto a wagon. The Geat troops honored their lord with magnificent funeral rites. The body of Beowulf was burned on a pyre according to pagan custom. The roar of the flames mingled with the cries of the mourners until the body of the hero had crumbled into pieces. Over a period of ten days, a great mound was built over the king's ashes that could be seen by seafarers off the coast. The cursed treasure was buried in the mound, useless now as it was before. Beowulf was given a final eulogy. Thus his hearth companions in the host of the Geats mourned the going of their lord. They said that of worldly kings he was the mildest of men and the gentlest, most kind to his people, most eager for fame. With these final words, most eager for fame, or in some interpretations, desirous of renown, we have a summary of the theme of Beowulf and a glimpse into the most important values of the people of its time. This value is called lof, a word difficult to translate with precision, but which roughly means the praise and esteem of one's countrymen. This theme is stated very clearly at the beginning of the poem with the line, For among all peoples it is only through those actions which merit praise that a man may prosper. Fame, then, is the most permanent of all things in this society. It even transcends death. Throughout the story, Beowulf is described as a man hungry for fame and desirous of renown. This desire came from a sense of the people at that time that life was transient, unstable, and impermanent. Fate, which they called weird, was impersonal, and man was powerless against it. Yet, according to the poet, man could still act. He could use the small amount of free will he's given to make the right choices, because, as the poem states, unless a man is doomed beforehand, fate is likely to be favorable to the courageous. Thus, free will should be used to demonstrate courage, and courage in turn will guarantee fame, the only thing worth having, the only thing that lasts. Courage was part of the Anglo-Saxon ethic, but there was more, too. Beowulf sums up the entire ethic when, as he's dying, he says he can rejoice in his life because he did not swear false oaths, defended what was his, did not pick quarrels, and can never be accused of the worst of all crimes, the murder of his own kin. He accepts his death calmly. It's been decreed by the almighty Weird. Throughout the poem, Beowulf alternately puts his faith in Weird, or fate, and the Lord God. He says at one point that fate goes ever as it must, which corresponds with the theme that man possesses little free will and is at the mercy of higher forces. Close to his death, he also remarks that he has endured his destiny. This is the classic resignation of the Stoic warrior. Within his limits, he has done the best that he can. Yet it is the Lord God triumphant who Beowulf believes has given him victory over Grendel's mother, the she-monster. And the poet tells us that the Danes can't expect relief from Grendel because they have fallen away from the true God. After Beowulf defeats the monsters, both Hrothgar, the Danish king, and Higelach, the Geat king, give thanks to God. And finally, when dying, it is God whom Beowulf thanks for his heroic victories. These apparent contradictions between an impersonal fate and God were explained earlier. The Anglo-Saxons were recent converts to Christianity and still held to some Germanic traditions that seemed opposite to Christian beliefs. The poet himself seems sometimes overcome with the confusion this created. He has trouble determining whether Grendel the monster is descended from Cain, the first murderer. 
And although the Old Testament, with Cain and Abel, the flood, and its vengeful, jealous portrayal of God, would have been easy for the Anglo-Saxons to understand, they would have had a much more difficult time with the New Testament and its turn-the-other-cheek morality. So although there are some New Testament themes in the poem, they are only briefly and indirectly mentioned. Beowulf indicates to historians just how slow and gradual was the infusion of Christian thought into the existing culture. Whether or not Christianity or pagan themes provide the message of the story, the message is at least clear in one sense. The struggle between good and evil is a mighty struggle, and good eventually triumphs. It triumphs through individuals of uncommon valor and integrity who succeed where many before them have failed. To many readers, Grendel's mother symbolizes evil, just as Beowulf symbolizes good. Beowulf descends into her underwater lair, into the forbidden darkness, much as a hero would descend into hell or the netherworld. There are other spiritual themes in the poem, too. For instance, purification. Beowulf referred to this directly when he said he would rid the land of the monster Grendel and thereby purify it. After he completes the deed, the warriors wash down the high hall, removing bloodstains and other traces of the battle, a scene many people see as a symbolic purification of sin. Grendel himself is described in ways that can only remind the reader of Satan, a wicked spoiler of men, the fiend, the criminal, the grim guest, the one with fire-hard hands from whose eye a horrid flame stood. Grendel stalks in from the moor, an area we are told is off-limits to the unbaptized. The dragon, too, in its dark den, breathing fire, seems symbolic of a creature from hell. Beowulf is a difficult work for many people, both the average reader and the trained scholar. The language, the style, the philosophy and apparent paradoxes of thought, the unclear references and its place in time, are all subjects of controversy, and until and if further discoveries are made, these controversies may never be resolved. Yet its themes of heroism, of the struggle between good and evil, and of the attempts of humans to make their lives as worthy as possible, are all understandable and supersede its importance as a chronicle of an earlier time that is still wrapped in a veil of mystery. This is the end of the session.